The Chartist Movement by Justin Kirkendall and Henry Carlson. The Chartist Movement that occurred in the year 1836 to 1848 in industrial Britain was a movement for greater rights to the working class. They fought for political representation in Parliament in order to gain the quality of life they deserved. This movement had a great impact on rights that the lower and working class had, and thus broke a political barrier for the English working class. Even though the movement was a complete failure, later lawmakers ended up satisfying the demands the Chartists had. These demands provided the basis of Britain's current government and laws, such as the secret ballot and mail universals. After visiting Manchester in 1835, Alexis de Tocqueville, a French writer and politician, had mentioned the poor conditions he saw in the workhouses in Manchester, Britain. Here humanity attains its most complete development and its most brutish. Here civilization works its miracles and civilized man is turned into almost a savage. As the Industrial Revolution paved Britain's future as an economic powerhouse, the upper classes began to become more wealthy compared to the state of the middle class which began to demand the quality of life in cities be improved. While the wealthy worried about clean streets, streetlights, and libraries, the working class was focused on their survival, as all people, including women and children, began working to satisfy the cost of urban living. Families lived in cramped, dirty tenant houses where disease rampaged. Almost all of the family expenses were on paying the rent. In the workhouses, conditions were worse, where in one instance, at Andover Workhouse, the the poor could be seen eating the flesh off a dead carcass. The poor law, or the new poor law, was one of the major causations of these poor conditions. The rich and wealthy believed the poor were lazy, and so conditions were purposefully made bad in factories and workhouses to discourage the poor from wanting help or any financial aid. As well, they had to pay to live in the factories or near them, and ended up practically paying for being poor. As a result, many writers at the time had taken to notice the conditions being found in the common workplaces of industrial Britain and wrote about it. Elizabeth Robbins, for example, criticized the poor way the children were looked after by the government in the workhouses in her article, Votes for Women. This report of the latest English Poor Law Commission, what it reveals is an incompetence and legalized cruelty and the treatment of the poor. Thousands of innocent children were left for themselves without the care of any adult. Robbins even noted one woman who, when tried to bathe the baby, did so in boiling water, and it died. Other written productions, like those of Charles Dickens, such as Oliver Twist and David Copperfield, portrayed horrible conditions as an attempt to educate the upper class about the suffering of the working class. The books, however, merely provided the upper class with another source of entertainment. Among this, workers began holding strikes for better wages and working conditions. Francis Place, an early reformer, rallied for reform acts in 1830 and 1831. Unions soon formed, which would push for reforms, including the London Working Men's Association, formed by William Lovett and William Hetherington. The association was the foundation of what will come to be the Chartist movement, a movement mainly for political equality inside of Parliament. The minute book of the association, written by William Lovett on October 18, 1836, with the help of Francis Place, contained five of six reforms that Chartism would push for. Universal suffrage, vote by ballot specifically in secrecy, equal representation in Parliament, annual parliaments, and no property qualifications for members of Parliament, not including the payments of members of Parliament. With the minute book having been written and the London Working Men's Association beginning to take action, the Chartist movement would start with the Charter of 1838, containing all six points the Chartists would desire. This document would be the basis of what the movement ran on, explaining the reforms. This group of powerful speakers and talkers would grow to become known for being radical, and over the course of a few years, would become more unliked and untrusted. They had zero members at the time with a position of political power besides that of Fergus O'Connor, who was a radical MP from Northern Ireland that did not have a large backing. Starting with the first petition in 1839, they gained 1,280,000 signatures, ending up being almost three miles long, with a fourth of the signatures being women. This petition was presented to Parliament by Chartist Thomas Atwood on June 14th. He asked members of Parliament to consider the petition, showing the voices of much of Britain and make a change. However, the petition was ignored, struck down with a vote of 235 to 46 MPs. The rejection of the Chartist petition made many members of the lower class angry, putting the idea of violent riots in people's eyes, with guns, pikes, and assorted flags and torches. Many riots occurred, with some of the most violent and infamous, including that in Birmingham and the Newport Rising. Thousands of people came to support the riots. However, most became violent from the radical views most Chartist leaders and people had. At Newport, the police were summoned, along with a private guard killed 21 men, supposedly 
supposedly protecting the upper class from these vicious tragedies. The murderers were not given charge. However, the leader of the riot, John Frost, the supporter of male suffrage and radicalism, was charged with treason and sentenced to death by hanging. Frost's sentence was commuted to transportation to Tasmania on the coastline of Australia. He later went to the U.S. and was allowed back in Britain in 1856. This and many more smaller riots made the Chartist movement seen as violent and terrible in the public eye, especially those of Parliament. Chartists would use the media as a terms of communication and as a way to express their ideas for the affordable price for the poor. The Poor Man's Guardian was a newspaper run by Henry Harrington, a founder of the London Working Men's Association, and first published on July 9, 1831, selling for just a penny for the profit of the poor, which suited the motto, knowledge is power. However, after not paying the stamp duty due, Harrington was prosecuted multiple times from 1831 to 1836. Other newspapers also ran, including the Northern Star, run by O'Connor, and the most successful, The Charter, run by William Lovett, which first published January 27th, 1839. In these newspapers, Chartists made poems, mostly by self-educated industrialists or artisans, workers, who expressed their feelings in order to inspire others to join the movement. This, however, did not give up their cause, and another two petitions followed the first. Built on the original that was ignored, the second was supposed to contain 3.3 million signatures, but was later discovered to be false. O'Connor, the MP of Nottingham, an extreme Irish uh, radical, brought the largest petition in the history of Chartism, as he claimed. The petition was to be marched to Parliament in Westminster, starting at Kensington Commons. On April 10, 1848, 30,000 of the planned 200,000 Chartists gathered. As British forces fortified the buildings, such as the Bank of England, 150,000 troops were called in, including the late Emperor Napoleon to act as constable. After meeting with the authorities, the mo movement broke up and the petition was slowly delivered to Parliament by peace. The astounding 5.75 million signatures were discovered to be about 2 million with signatures such as Queen Victoria and the Duke of Wellington and Mr. Punch to be falsified. Newspapers like the London News published humorous cartoons taking Chartism as a source of humor. Chartist credibility and reputations were ruined, and after the delivery of the final petition, Chartism had broken up a failure. Following the breakup of the movement, Chartism still lingered around for some time. Sent to the current prison colony of Australia, prisoner Chartists spread their beliefs to fellow workers such as those in the Eureka Mines in Victoria, Australia. Chartist demands were put forth and achieved the first Victoria Parliament and it obtained a secret ballot showing Chartism's widespread effects. Due to radicals such as O'Connor, many Chartists were seen as untrustworthy. After having been found guilty of falsifying signatures after the march at Kensington Common, one thanked the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police for keeping order and protecting us from these repeated attempts to disturb a public peace in this and the adjoining neighborhoods by a class of misguided people calling themselves Chartists. They were also feared and disliked, leading to the arrest of many, one including Alan Pinkington, a Scottish-born American detective. Pinkington became involved in the Chartist movement, wanting to help his country. However, after expressing his radical views, a war was put out for his arrest. During arrest, Pinkington fled to America and founded his famous detective agency. This showed how the general public, along with the upper class, were willing to take action to remove the still possible threat from the country. However, after the failure of Chartism, government figures began to take the demands of Chartism and passing reform acts. Often suiting one of the Chartist reforms, John Bright was a radical reformer and statesman who, before and during the Chartist movement, battled the Anti-Corn Law and founded the Anti-Corn Law League. Bright founded the Reform Union in 1864, which, along with other groups like the London Working Men's, Men's Garibaldi Association and Reform League, became the largest working class movement since Chartism. Many former Chartists had joined these large groups as an extension to their own movement. These groups of radicals all had the main goal they wanted to accomplish, and before the Reform Union, it was household suffrage with a vote per household. For the League, it was manhood suffrage in the mid-Victorian era of Britain, the radicalism of the working class began changing, as there was much more social structure and many middle-class reformers felt that sections of the working class represented hard-working people and respectability and were extremely important to the middle-class culture. In May 1866, Liberal Chancellor of the Bar William Edward Gladstone introduced another bill into Parliament which would increase voting rights to 400,000 more, but it was rejected by the Conservations, fearing working class involvement in politics. Robert Lowe, one of the leaders of this group, characterized the working class as violent, ignorant, and generally unfit to take parts in the political politics of the nation. He was convinced that they would use their votes to attack the upper orders of society. This fight in Parliament for reform led to mass protests in June and July, on, and on July 7th, a national demonstration was led in Hyde Park, and even though the meeting was banned, many broke through the bars of the park. As well, Bright went around the country on a national tour, speaking, showing, showing Parliament that reform was not going away. Parliament began to present more, including that presented by Benjamin Disraeli in 1867, which based the voting for the first time on household suffrage. This reform Act, however, had major restrictions that included compounding that would be stopping much of the working class from voting. Hodgkinson. Many restrictions were involved resolved through deals such as amendment prohibiting the protection 
the practice of compounding and made more people eligible for voting. This bill in the end added an extra 500,000 people. However, the disfranchising people in many parts of the country and in Wales. Other documents like the Secret Ballot Act of 1872 and Parliament Act of 1911 made some of the charter schools reality. After some years, in order to improve working conditions, bills like the National Insurance Act of 1911, giving workers medical benefits and insurance, chartism was the first truly national mass working movement, and later movements and protests such as those in Gabon and Ga Kenya pushed for very similar things, making chartism seen as a father of national movements.